Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. So today's video is another solved case, but it's one that happened 30 years ago and it actually took 22 years before it was solved. But before we get into today's video, I just wanted to go ahead and say a big thank you to today's sponsor, Native. If you've seen any of my previous videos, you probably know how much I love Native as a company. Not only do they make amazing deodorants with a huge variety of scents, but they also make it a point to be more sustainable overall. It's so important to me to be aware of the choices that I making on a daily basis so that I can live my life more sustainably overall. Native makes that effort feel easy now that they've released a new plastic-free deodorant. The packaging is made from paperboard and Native is committed to sourcing from responsibly managed forests. Native is also a proud partner of 1% for the planet and commits 1% of all plastic-free deodorant sales to environmental nonprofits. Native makes deodorants that are vegan and cruelty-free with natural ingredients like coconut oil, shea butter, while staying aluminum-free, paraben-free, and sulfate-free, all with sustainable packaging. I personally like to keep a deodorant in my backpack as well as my purse in case I forget to put on deodorant before I leave the house, which embarrassingly enough, I do that more than I would like to admit, but their dry, non-sticky, fast-drying formula makes it so easy to just throw on some deodorant in the car before I head off into wherever I'm going. I also love how long wearing it is. It lasts me all throughout my school or work day, and then even when I go to work out after that, I still smell amazing by the time I get home. The best part to me is just how many amazing scents they have, including two new scents that have just launched, Lilac and White Tea and Tangerine and Citrus Blossom. The scents that I have now are, of course, as you know, Lavender and Rose. You guys already know this one is my baby, and if I could wear one deodorant for the rest of my life, it would definitely be this one. I love the scent so much. All you have to do is take the top off and then push it up from the bottom just like a push pop. I also have the coconut and vanilla one, which is another staple in my collection because it has such a sweet yet natural smell that I absolutely love. The last one I have is cucumber and mint. And honestly, this is a new scent to me because I wasn't sure if I would like it. But honestly, I absolutely love the way this one smells. It just smells so fresh and so clean. Now, normally three plastic free deodorants go for $39, but if you use my link in the description box below and use code RACHELSHANNON4, you can get a three pack for $29, which is 25% off. There is free shipping available to the US and shipping is available to the countries listed here. So again, make sure you go ahead and click the link down below and use code RACHELSHANNON4 to get 25% off of your three pack of plastic free deodorants. Thank you again to Native for sponsoring today's video. All right, with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. So so the case that I have for you today is one that is very disturbing, it's very uncomfortable to listen to, there's a lot of corruption, and it's unbelievable how this entire thing played out. I saw this case covered on a TV show actually, and I'm not exactly sure which one, I'm not going to throw any names out there because I don't remember honestly and I don't want to be wrong. I will link it down below if I can find it again. Um, but after watching the episode and then going on to read the court documents and articles and everything that was released about this case, I realized how much the episode was dramatized, which I know I shouldn't be surprised. Every crime show like that dramatizes every single case to get views and make it more entertaining. But I also saw that they left out a ton of information. They got some information wrong and I feel like they portrayed people involved in the way that they wanted to versus how they actually seem to be involved in this case. Again, I understand that shows need to do what they gotta do to make it more dramatic and entertaining and make their money, but I was a little bit annoyed with how they portrayed this entire thing and how much they left out and made people look a certain way. So hopefully if you did see that episode, this video can clear up a lot of things that maybe you were confused about or maybe it'll completely go against what they said and what you believe because again, I did read the court documents and I kind of got a different idea of what went on versus what the show portrayed. So with that being said, let's get into today's video. Today, we are going to be discussing the solved case of Karina Mullen. Karina Lynn Mullen was born on September 1st, 1967 in St. Louis, Missouri to her parents Claude and Patricia Mullen. She was the oldest of three siblings, Heather, Dina, and Donnie. Now in 1977, when she was 10 years old, her father moved the family from St. Louis to Kentucky in hopes of creating a better and safer life for their family. He reported 
reported that while living in St. Louis, he had witnessed so many shootings and crime that he couldn't even let his children play outside. So Karina grew up in a farm in rural Kentucky and by all accounts, she had a good childhood and a good upbringing and was very close with her family. But when she was 20 years old, she decided to move to Central City, Kentucky with their three-year-old daughter, Stephanie. She was a young, single mother at the time and wanted to move to this area because it seemed like a small, safe town to raise her baby girl. She had found a nice apartment to stay in with one other roommate who also had a little girl of her own. Now, Central City is a very small town of only 5,000 people. It's a very religious town with several churches throughout and it was the type of town where everyone knew everyone. But despite being a small town country girl, she had big dreams and aspirations for herself. She wanted to go to school to study medicine and become a doctor. But for the time being, she worked at the police station doing some clergy work and cleaning up around the station throughout the day so that she could make extra money and support Stephanie. Now, only six months after moving out of her family home, she actually decided to move back home with her parents. I'm not exactly sure why, but it just seemed like she wasn't happy with her situation and thought that maybe living with her parents on a farm was what was best for her daughter. On October 1st, 1987, she got all of her things packed up and dropped Stephanie off at her parents' farm for the night. She was expected to come back and join them to finish up the move the next day. However, she actually never ended up showing up. Now, the next morning on October 2nd, a city street worker in Mullenberg County in Central City noticed a car with blood on it near the city garage. He noticed that there had been blood coming out of the trunk as if it was dripping out. Of course, immediately that worker called police who showed up shortly after. Now, being that Karina worked for the police station, when police arrived, they immediately noticed her car and immediately recognized her plates. Her plates said Rennie, which is the nickname that those around her often called her. Detective Billy Fields was the first to arrive on scene and he opened up the trunk of this car only to find a woman who he immediately recognized as Karina inside the trunk dead. She was naked, absolutely covered in blood. She was wrapped up in a blanket and she was laying in the fetal position. So they went ahead and searched the car and the surrounding area, but they didn't find much, which suggested that she had not been killed where she had been found. She was killed somewhere else and then placed into the trunk and then driven to the location where she would later be found. Upon immediate examination of her body, they found three hairs on her back as well as some dirt and gravel on her body. After this, her body was sent off to the medical examiner who performed the autopsy. And this is when we find out about the absolutely horrific condition that she was in and just how much she suffered before her death. She had been severely beaten and stabbed. She had multiple facial injuries. She had two stab wounds and one cut on her neck. She had bruises on her back and her arms. One of her nipples was actually cut off and there were very clear signs of horrific sexual abuse. She also had clear signs of defensive wounds on her wrists, fingertips, and palms, which had showed that she had fought with every ounce of strength in her body. Her actual cause of death was determined to have been asphyxiation on her own blood. So the next thing investigators did was examine her bedroom in her apartment where she was planning on moving away from. First, they found that there was absolutely no sign of forced entry into the apartment. Then immediately they found large amounts of blood all over the bed and the floor. They found several articles of clothing thrown all around the room. Altogether, they gathered all of this evidence and sent it off to the Kentucky State Laboratory for examination. The next thing they did was they went ahead and questioned everyone who knew Karina. The lead detective, Billy Field, first went and questioned Karina's roommate, Angela Smith. According to Angela, the night before Karina's death, the two decided to go out for the night and have some fun. Stephanie was with her grandparents at their house and Angela's little girl was with her dad that night, so they had a little bit of time to themselves to go ahead and let loose. She said that the two went to some bars and had some drinks and by all accounts, Karina was having a great time and was in a great mood. Angela said that they were drinking pretty heavily and that both of them were pretty drunk. Then, according to Angela, the two of them were both home by midnight. Once they got home, the two sat on the couch and watched some TV together before Karina got up to go to bed. 
However, before going to bed, Karina told Angela to leave the door unlocked because she was expecting her boyfriend, 19-year-old Jimmy Springer, to come over that night. We will talk about who Jimmy is in just a minute. Now, the crime scene showed that it was very apparent that Karina had suffered a very violent and horrific attack before her death. And their apartment was incredibly small and their bedrooms actually shared a wall together. However, Angela claimed that she hadn't seen Karina since the previous night around midnight and said that she hadn't seen or heard anything that happened to Karina. She said that she slept through the entire night and didn't hear anything and didn't even know if Karina was home all night or if she had left at some point. Angela said that she had actually been so heavily under the influence of alcohol and she had taken some sleeping pills, so she thinks that's why she didn't hear anything. Thing, but obviously, this was still incredibly strange. Either way, those around Karina didn't think Angela had any reason to lie. The two had only been living together for six months, so no one thought that there was any reason for them to have any animosity between the two of them. Also, everyone around them said that they seemed like they were pretty good friends who got along very well. So now let's talk about Jimmy Springer. Jimmy and Karina had been dating for around six months at the time. He was the type of guy who didn't really have a straight path that he was on. He just sort of floated around to different constructions and maintenance job to make money. But according to Karina's family, the two did not have the best relationship and they really didn't like Jimmy. They said that they would often have fights and that there was a lot of jealousy and hostility in their relationship. This was also confirmed by Angela who said that he just was not the best guy. He was jealous and possessive, and Angela said that in the days prior to Karina's murder, there was more and more tension building in the relationship. Then, it just so happened that the night she leaves the door open for Jimmy to come in, she's found murdered. Karina's family also mentioned that there was a violent side to Jimmy. There was one instance where I guess she wasn't supposed to go out, but Jimmy found Karina out at a bar and he asked her what she was doing and just being very accusatory. Then when they got home, he very aggressively took a washcloth and wiped all of the makeup off of her face. When she told her parents about this, they were absolutely horrified. So, a few days after this and just a few days before the murder, she told her parents that she wanted to break up with Jimmy. And so, it's thought that maybe this is why she was moving out of the apartment that she lived in and wanted to move back in with her parents. It seems like maybe her and Angela and Jimmy were in sort of the same group of friends. I'm not exactly sure, but that could be a reason why she didn't want to live there anymore. So, of course, police went ahead and questioned Jimmy. First, he told Detective Field that they had a very good relationship, which is contrast to what everybody else was saying. When they asked him about that night, he admitted that he did go to her apartment that night, but he said that when he got there, she was not in her room. He said that when he walked in, he immediately noticed that there was blood on her door and on her bed as well, but said that she was not laying in her bed. But then, after saying all of this, he just left. He said that he was very concerned about her, so he went around Central City to look for Karina, but he didn't find her anywhere, so he just went home and went to bed. He didn't call the police. He didn't tell anybody about what he had just seen. He just went to bed and slept that night like a baby. So, of course, detectives immediately suspected him. He was incredibly suspicious, and who the heck just goes over to the apartment of someone that they're supposed to be dating and they're supposed to love, or literally anybody else for that matter, and then sees a bunch of blood and then just doesn't do anything about it. It seems like this was a very open and shut case. However, as they went through the investigation, there were some things that they found that were very strange and completely contradicted what they were told about that night. The first thing was that after completing the toxicology report, turns out there was no alcohol in Karina's system. Like I said earlier, Angela had told police that both of them were very intoxicated, that they were out in the bars the night that she was killed, yet there was no alcohol or anything else found in her system. Then they went to this bar to see if there were any eyewitnesses that placed her at the bar, but there was absolutely nobody who reported seeing Karina there. So all of the signs pointed to Angela lying and the two not having gone out that night. So they wanted to try and figure out why Angela may have been lying, so they started to go ahead and look into those who she associated herself with. One man in particular 
was named Jeffrey Boyd. Jeffrey Boyd was known around Central City for being this big, tough, intimidating guy who sold and trafficked drugs like crack cocaine. Turns out the night that Karina was murdered, she was seen by an unnamed witness arguing with Jeffrey. This witness also claimed that he saw Jeffrey with a gun that night. Also, turns out just two days before this argument, Karina went to the police station to let them know what Jeffrey was really involved in. She reported to them that he was selling drugs and was trafficking stolen items around Central City. She was also already known by Detective Fields, not just because she worked there, but also because a few months prior, she had been caught and charged with shoplifting after she was stealing some baby items. So Detective Fields went up and followed up with this witness and turns out there were a lot of holes in this guy's story. Suddenly, this witness was now saying that he thought Jeffrey had threatened her with a gun, but that he didn't actually see the gun. He said whatever he was holding maybe looked like a gun, but he wasn't totally sure. So Detective Fields determined that this argument actually did not happen. There wasn't any other physical evidence connecting Jeffrey to Karina, so building a case against him would have been flimsy at best. So then they set their sights back on the most obvious suspect, Jimmy Springer. He was at the crime scene. He admitted to seeing blood everywhere and not reporting anything. This was all super suspicious, so police took Jimmy into custody and charged him with Karina's murder. By July of 1999, the murder trial started, but the trial only lasted two days before it was handed off to the jury. They only deliberated for a few hours before they came back with a verdict of not guilty due to a lack of evidence. There was absolutely no physical evidence that he was responsible only circumstantial evidence. Yes, he was at the apartment that night. Yes, they had a tumultuous relationship, but there was nothing solid that pointed towards him being guilty. The family was just so absolutely horrified at this point, and they had absolutely no idea what to do. So after this, the case just went cold. There was absolutely no movement in the case, no new leads, no new evidence, nothing pointing them in any sort of direction. So after holding on to Karina's car for several months, they return the car back to Karina's parents, still bloody and full of evidence. This really motivated Karina's father even more to get to the bottom of who did this to his daughter. He was not going to go down without a fight. He was going to find out what happened to his beautiful daughter if it was the last thing he did. So he went ahead and collected his own evidence from Karina's car. He opened up the passenger side door of the car. He reached in and he found a pocket knife that was still covered in blood. Immediately, he called the state police to hand over the knife. Then he just sat back and waited for the results, going into the station as often as he could to ask for updates. But eventually it came back and they said that there was no human blood found on the knife. So. That means that there's no way that this could have been the murder weapon. But this setback did not stop him. He went out and searched the woods. He went around all of Central City and Karina's neighbors to figure out if anyone knew anything or heard anything from that night. He sat down at his kitchen table and had the evidence just spread out every single day, hoping to catch on to a lead that he didn't previously notice. He made sure to stay in contact with the lead investigator on her case, Detective Fields, who assured him that they were doing everything that they could to catch her killer. But for over two decades, they found absolutely nothing. The case just sat there. Claude couldn't find anything that could help out with the investigation, and the family became absolutely exhausted. It came to a point where they just couldn't keep going. By 1992, the original detectives on the case retired and a new detective, Terry Arnett, took over the case. He gave this case new life and spent so much of his time following new leads and getting to the bottom of exactly what happened to Karina. He was exhausting every resource that he had access to. He built a very solid case full of new evidence, but unfortunately, by 2004, he actually found out that he had cancer that was going to take his life before he ended up finishing on the case. So he actually handed over the case to Curtis McGee, who was a pastor at a church at the time, but is now a sheriff of Mulligan County. So after Detective Arnett passed away, McGee took over the case along with Detective Fleming, who looked into the new evidence that they had found. Now, so much of the evidence that Arnett found absolutely shocked the officers. So, like we said, after the initial investigation, 
investigation, Detective Fields collected the evidence and it was sent off to the Kentucky State Lab for testing. However, after Jimmy Springer was acquitted of all charges, 23 pieces of the evidence went missing under Billy Fields' watch. So they did everything that they could to find out what happened to this evidence, but Central City Police were turning them away, saying that they had no idea what happened to the evidence. So then he went to the Kentucky State Lab, who said that this evidence was never actually tested. They only test evidence that they are told to run tests on, and no one requested any tests be done on any of this evidence. So a word got out about the renewed interest in Karina's case, and that is when a new witness came forward to tell detectives what she knew. Now, she said that the reason that she hadn't come forward earlier was because what she witnessed absolutely horrified her for two decades, and she was just frozen in fear. She felt like she could not tell anybody, and you will see why in just a minute. So, 20 years prior, Samantha was only 16 years old. Now, she said that one night, she was walking outside on the sidewalk to get home to her parents' house from her friend's house. She said that she was right in front of her parents' house outside when all of a sudden, a police car pulled up next to her. Two men came out of the police car and shoved her into the back of the car. The first man was a large, stocky, intimidating man who she didn't recognize, but as we will later find out, was actually Jeffrey Boyd, the large stocky drug dealer that I mentioned earlier. But the other man, the police officer, she recognized immediately. It was lead detective Billy Fields. The two men took her to Karina's apartment where they found Karina in her living room. Samantha said that there were two other men present as well. One was a much smaller, slimmer man than the other two, and he appeared to be a lot younger. He would eventually be identified as Jimmy Kramer. Then the fourth man she identified was actually Jimmy Springer, Karina's boyfriend. Then, according to Samantha, Billy Field and Karina started to argue and yell at one another, but she wasn't exactly sure what the argument was about initially. However, one thing that was suspected was that Karina may have actually been involved with Billy Field at some point and may have been making false statements saying that she was pregnant and that he was the father. We will get more into that in just a minute, but that is what Samantha thinks that the argument may have been about. So, after they had been arguing for a little bit, Samantha said, that Billy Fields just started yelling at Karina about opening her mouth, saying that she was going to get what she deserved. So Fields shoved Karina into her bedroom and then continued yelling at her. Then Jeffrey Boyd shoved Samantha into the bedroom as well and held her down and forced her to watch as Detective Fields beat Karina with a metal bar. As this was happening, Jimmy Kramer joined in in the attack. Throughout the next several hours throughout the night, three of the men sexually assaulted Karina and took turns beating her. Samantha identified that Jimmy Kramer, Detective Fields, and Jeffrey Boyd were all the one who were doing this. Then, at the very end of all of this, Detective Fields stabbed her and killed her. However, according to Samantha, Jimmy Springer was not a willing participant in beating Karina. Apparently, he had actually tried to help her at one point, but was unable to, which is understandable if it's three against one, but we don't know for sure if he really was a willing participant because, as we will find out later, he obviously couldn't go to trial because he was already acquitted of the murder. Something else that was different between the TV show and court documents is that I didn't see anywhere in the court documents that Samantha they reported that these three men actually sexually assaulted her, so I don't know if they did, but the TV show said that they did, so I don't know if that's something that they just threw in or if it really happened and I just didn't see it anywhere in the reports. So after all of this happened, Jimmy Carter fled the apartment as fast as he could while Boyd and detectives wrapped Karina's body in the blanket that she will later be found in and put her into the trunk of her own car. At that point that she was put into the trunk, it's unknown whether she was already dead or if she was just unconscious. After Karina's body was in the trunk, according to Samantha, she was forced to drive to the parking lot where Boyd was already waiting for her and where they would later find the car. After parking the car, she jumped out and booked it as far and as fast as she could and she made it home. Fields and Boyd didn't put much effort into finding her because they knew that the 16-year-old would not say anything, she was terrified, and they were right. After this incident, Samantha had absolutely no contact with any of these men and the only person that she had ever told us before 
was her adopted mother. So this confession is really what pulled everything together and led investigators to being able to bring this case to trial. So finally, by November 2nd, 2006, Billy Fields was arrested for the murder of Karina Mullen. People around the town were absolutely shocked. He was still living in Central City at the time and everybody around him loved him. Police also arrested Jimmy Kramer, Jeffrey Boyd, Jimmy Springer, and Karina's roommate, Angela Smith. They originally were going to do a shared trial between all five of them. However, it was ultimately decided that Jimmy Springer and Angela Smith would get their own trials while Jimmy Kramer, Jeffrey Boyd, and Billy Fields all had a shared trial. By April of 2009, the trials started. Of course, the three men didn't want a shared trial, especially Billy Fields, since he was being charged with some different things like tampering with physical evidence. But the courts denied this and decided that it was fair to try them together. Now, in addition to this confession, these new detectives had gathered a bunch of new evidence that put together a picture of exactly what Detective Billy Fields had been involved in. He apparently had facilitated this matter massive drug ring in Central City, which brought in a ton of money for him and his associate, Jeffrey Boyd. So it seemed like when Karina found out exactly what Boyd was doing and reported it to her supervisors at the police station, Billy Fields wanted none of this. So that was the first motive that prosecutors considered. They also considered a possible motive that Karina had made this false statement saying that she was pregnant with Billy Fields' child and that he killed her because of that. Now, I don't know if anywhere this was confirmed that she was even pregnant to begin with, but as far as I know, I don't think she was. I also don't know if it's confirmed that she was involved with Billy Fields. I don't even know if she really did make these statements around the town that Billy Fields was the father of her child. I don't know why she made these statements. I don't know why she would come up with a lie, but that's just kind of what was rumored and was considered by prosecutors as a possible motive. The most likely scenario to me is that pretty much everyone that I mentioned in this video were all intertwined in the drug scene. It seems to me like Karina, Angela, Jimmy Kramer, and Springer, and Jeffrey Boyd all knew each other and were all involved with drugs. It seemed that for whatever reason, Billy Fields got involved in this, started hiding all of the drug activity, took part in the trafficking part for monetary gain. Then it's thought that maybe even Samantha Robinson, this witness, was involved with drugs as well. During the trial, of course, the main thing against these three men was the confession, but the defense questioned Samantha's credibility. They thought that it was strange that she said that they randomly abducted her off of the street with the full intention of just taking her and making her watch them kill some woman that she didn't even know. It seems more likely that she probably knew them, was probably involved with drugs, and then went with them when they went to kill Karina. Now, I don't think that she went there knowing that they were going to kill her. I don't think that she was a willing participant in any of it. I do truly believe her that she was made to watch them abuse and kill her. I don't think she wanted to be there. I don't think she knew what she was getting involved with. I do think that they forced her into this situation. But I also don't think that she was just some random girl that was abducted off the streets. I do think that she knew them in some way or somehow maybe she went with them thinking that this was going to be some sort of way to get drugs. I don't know, but I do think that she was involved with them in some way. So the other thing that got brought up is that it's thought that Billy Fields had intimidated several witnesses, which I will get more into in just a minute, but it's thought that maybe Samantha was intimidated by him as well, and that's why she never came forward with what she knew. We don't know for sure which man did what in participating in raping or killing Karina, or if it was just Billy Fields while the rest were just there and watching him and cheering him on. Maybe her recount of the story was 100% true and factual, but to me, it really doesn't make a difference whether all of them took part in physically attacking her or if they were just present. I think that they are all equally responsible either way, but again, her testimony was the main evidence that they had at the trial. So now let's get more into the witness statements that were collected by Billy Fields at the start of the investigation. So let's start with Angela. Turns out that Angela was awake during the night of the murder and she heard everything. But according to Samantha, she was in her own room and she was crying and she was curled up in a ball and she was listening to everything that was happening to her friend and roommate. And of course, she knew that Detective Billy Fields was involved, so it seems like that's why she came up with this whole story that the two had gotten drunk together and then 
You know, she asked to leave the door open for her boyfriend. It seems like she may have also been intimidated by Billy Fields, but again, this is all of what Samantha is saying, so we don't know. She could have been involved. She could have known this was going to happen, and she didn't do anything about it. I don't really know. So in addition to Angela Smith's false statement, obviously when they were investigating the murder, Billy Fields went around to the neighbors to see if anyone had seen or heard anything and initially every single neighbor had said that they didn't hear anything. But of course it seems like he may have also intimidated them into silence. There was actually a witness who saw a patrol car outside of her apartment the night that Karina was murdered but she was made to keep quiet and she only came out with this information after she knew it was safe to. There apparently was another witness who saw Jeffrey Boyd walking away from the crime scene covered in blood, but again, it seemed like Billy Field intimidated them into silence. I also want to say I don't know if this witness statement is true. I don't know if that was thrown into the show for added, you know, spice, seeing a man walking away covered in blood from the crime scene. I don't know if that actually happened. Again, I did not see that one in the court document so take that one with a grain of salt. But being the lead homicide detective in the town, people everywhere were absolutely terrified to speak up. I mean, who could they go to? If the wrong person found out that they were speaking up, they could be killed too. The other part of the trial focused on Billy Fields getting rid of evidence. So after all of the evidence and all of their DNA and semen were collected from the crime scene, it was Billy Fields' responsibility to get all of these items tested. But of course, he ordered no tests because he knew that it would be his evidence and his DNA all over the crime scene. And that's also why Jimmy Springer's trial was so short and why he got acquitted so quickly because there was zero forensic evidence to bring forward. Then after Jimmy Springer's trial, any evidence that was brought forward, Billy Fields ordered the items to come back to him, and the paperwork from the lab had confirmed that it had not been examined at Billy Fields' request. And these pieces of evidence have never been found after they were returned to Billy Fields, so it's thought that after he got them, he hid them or destroyed them and got rid of them. So at the end of this trial, Billy Fields was convicted of murder, first-degree rape, kidnapping, first-degree sodomy, and tampering with physical evidence. Jeffrey Boyd was convicted of murder, first-degree degree rape and kidnapping. Jimmy Kramer was convicted of first degree manslaughter, rape, and kidnapping. For these charges, Fields and Boyd were sentenced to life, while Kramer was sentenced to 60 years. Now, I don't exactly know the details for the trials of Angela Smith and Jimmy Springer, but Angela Smith was ultimately charged with perjury because she lied in the interview and hindered the investigation. Jimmy Springer could not be charged with murder since he was already acquitted of that charge, like I said earlier, but he was also charged with perjury and complicity. So that is where the case ends and that is all the information that I have on Karina's case. There was so much corruption in this small town that everybody was just terrified to speak up. It's absolutely terrifying because if something like this happened to you in this small town, you would really have absolutely nowhere to go. And as far as I have seen, the town is still very corrupt and not a lot has changed, unfortunately. It's just so heartbreaking because Karina's father was trying his best to get justice for his daughter and he even did his own investigation and he was constantly being reassured by Billy Field saying that they were working hard to find justice. He looked him straight in the eye knowing that he was the one who killed his beautiful daughter. And Unfortunately, Karina's mother, Patricia, had passed away two years before charges were brought against these men, so she never lived to see her daughter's murderers be put away, which is just so absolutely heartbreaking. I'm very upset with how long it took to uncover this horrific corruption in this town, but I'm glad that they were ultimately found and brought to justice. It seems like, unfortunately, Karina got involved with the wrong people. It seems like maybe she was involved with drugs to some level, but maybe she realized that things were a lot deeper than she thought and she wanted someone to be held accountable and that's when she decided that she was going to say something, but that's what ultimately cost her her life. I'm just so angry that Stephanie had to grow up without a mother because these disgusting men were afraid that they were going to get caught in the illegal stuff that they were involved with. Stephanie is now grown with a daughter of her own. It's just sad because she doesn't really have any memories with her mom. She doesn't remember her mom and her daughter doesn't have a grandma. 
It's just so horrible. So that is all I have for today's video. Thank you for taking the time to listen to Karina's story, and I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn on the notifications to get notified every single time I post a new video. Don't forget to follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And don't forget to go ahead and head over to Native and get 25% off of your three pack of plastic free deodorants using code RACHELSHANNON4. If you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and send them over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.